Julie McInnes, welcome to the podcast. Hello, Julie Lorraine. I'm very glad to be here. <laughs> Hi. It has been a while, hasn't it? Um, well, you have to tell me. Is it a couple of years since you came and visited? You took photos of me and uh, Natalie and then played my cello and I think that's the last time we saw each other. Then I, then yeah. you, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Yeah, it's been a while. It's been it's been a few years, definitely. And so I wanted to have you on the podcast for for many reasons, mostly because you're a, uh, you're a force in music, in my opinion. And um, I think that you have a lot to say on music, on voice, on industry work. Uh, and also, you gave me an experience that I'd never experience in my life. You allowed me to hold a cello and not just to hold a cello, but to actually uh, kind of play it. I, I, I use the term play very loosely because I have no idea what I was doing, but it was well, interesting because I felt it. What did you feel? I felt, I felt like a, almost like a reverberation of the instrument against my heart. And I thought to myself, is this what Julie feels every time she plays the cello? Well, I do think it's an extraordinary instrument in that way and that it, you do hold it close to your chest and you do feel the vibrations through your body. Um, there are other instruments that do that, but just speaking about the cello, it's literally sitting against your chest. And um, uh, you can have a lot of fun with that too. I mean, you can put your head on it. and uh, But uh, um, I think some people will sit down to play a cello and usually they're either shy about it, uh, enthralled and taken. And I think your re reaction is in like the top 10 because you really got it you got how exceptional it is to sort of actually be able to just draw what is ostensibly um, actually uh, horsehair across a string and feel it vibrate starting at the chest and through other parts of your body. I mean, you don't get that with violin, yeah. I don't think. You get other things, but um, um, I don't know, double bass, you, you hold it against your chest too. I, I guess double bass would be extraordinary as well. Yeah, it was definitely a, a visceral experience. And so what I want to do is I want to show, I want not show, but I want people to hear what you can do with a cello. A lot of people, what happens with um, a lot of musicians is that they don't have as much recognition as singers sometimes. And so I want to uh, give people um, an idea of, of the kind of work that you've done with the cello. So I'm going to play a little, a little demo here. It's about a minute long, so the audience can really get a feel for your work. So that's a, a pretty good example of what you can do with the cello. Uh, did you start playing the cello at, at a very young age? I did, actually. I, I, was, I was very lucky. I grew up in a very small country town, but around my by age 11 or something, age 10, the state of South Australia and Australia uh, sent out instruments all over the state. Uh, our Prime Minister, our Premier, Don Dunstan, was really into the arts and he was the founder of the um, Adelaide Arts Festival, which is one of the world famous ones. And so there were a whole bunch of, of us kids all around uh, uh, South Australia that received, you know, two cellos, maybe six violins and two, two violas, if you're lucky. And I remember turning up and I'd done the music audition and um, I'd already been to some main music camps. I was really an irrepressibly musical child um trying everything so 
so it, the cello had actually been picked out for me. So everybody arrived and picked their thing or, and I, I just had my name on this cello in a brown canvas bag. And that's when I started and I just kept playing. I had a violin teacher because I was in the Riverland and the only teacher available was a violin player. Um, but she was very good, Mrs. Eli, and she literally drove all over the Riverland to teach these kids and she'd stump around. And um, That's when it started and playing a little bit in the Riverland Orchestra, playing playing at school, just very simple pieces. And I started to um, get a bit of notice and I got invited to have some lessons from the head of the music department in Adelaide. So I got a lot of encouragement um, early on and I really loved it. And I used to play duets with my father who played piano very well. So it was very easy to enjoy it and not for it to get lost, which it often does. You have a bad teacher. You don't have a context um, in which to enjoy it. And then I kept playing the cello for a long time through, I uh, was one of my instruments, uh, guitar. I started on guitar, then cello, and voice is what I used for my music um, matriculation is what we call it. I don't know what, I can't remember what you call it here, but basically the finish of school. And then I, and then I kind of just, it sat in its bag in the corner for a long time until I, and I was playing saxophone and picking up things. Then I got asked to be in this techno funk band and I put, a, you know, some electricity into the cello and on we went, you know, I, I just picked it up and then started to play the cello in a very different way. Um, and then that kept on going. I went to Circus Oz um, at age 28, much later, but I'd been playing in various bands by that stage. And, um, I mean, I, I think you're going to ask me about that, but that certainly was the beginning of, I, mean, I, I wrote from some TV and some film, but when I came to Circus Oz in Australia, which is a very like larrikin, inventive circus in Australia to this date, of a very small cast, and we all had to do everything. So there were the musicians that we had, maybe there'd be two, maybe there'd be three out of the 11 or 12, and everybody did everything. But you had to kind of make a lot of sounds um, for all of the different acts. So not only did I pick up a number of instruments, I played a lot of bass guitar, saxophone, cello, or not, but we had to learn how to play them differently to, to make different sounds, to kind of create what's this, like a, um, to get the biggest bang for our buck. Basically. Right. So I learned to be really inventive with it and I started playing in, you know, a lot, with a lot of harmonics and playing the cello, the bow upside down and playing it very rhythmically, like, you know, very rhythmically. Um, so it, it was the part of the huge experimental um, uh, expansion of my music. I didn't end up expanding within a verse, verse, chorus, bridge world at all for a long time. One of the questions I always ask artists, is whether or not their family was supportive during uh, during their artistic youth, let's say, uh, before they became, you know, um, successful. Uh, because sometimes parents kind of change their tune after they see that you can do it. But did they give you early on, did they give you support early on to pursue the arts? Absolutely. Absolutely. My, my uh, mother and father both came from musical families. My father was a musician. My mother wasn't so much, but they were both I mean, I had a guitar at age 10, I think, a very cheap little thing, but it got me started. You know, I started playing with Rocky Page, who was this extraordinary hypnotist act, like one-man circus, and we'd play in this really weird building, and he was teaching people piano, accordion, and guitar at the same time. Uh, but, but to your question, mum and dad made sure I had a guitar at a very young age and I was already singing songs and whatnot, and I just... I took it up and I've had nothing but encouragement from them. And and in the end, respect, because it did turn into a, a, a professional career that um, served me well. Not not every musical story can, musician story is that, because some people are extraordinary musicians and never get picked up to, to go and do that. But um, 
I, I was teaching myself, you know, every song I could learn from Gordon Lightfoot. I have a lot of Canadians, even though I was in Australia, I have a lot of Canadians I was listening to. Joni Mitchell was a big part, Gordon Lightfoot and Leonard Cohen and it's even more. But um, I would just buy their whole songbook and strip them apart and learn it and learn it and and then you start Which getting... I find interesting. Yeah, I find on. that interesting because, like you said, you you were with you know Circus Oz, which allowed for a lot of experimentation with instruments and and really kind of more of a whimsical environment. Um, and then here you are also learning Joni Mitchell and Leonard Cohen, two vastly different um, kind of subject matters and, and different approaches. Well, that's what I was starting off with as a at playing guitar. You know, when when I was very young, before I had the cello. Um, okay. The, yes, no, just to put it in. And, of course, some of them have stayed with me. But, no, that was just as a, you know, a person who sang here, here you have a guitar, you learn the guitar and you can accompany yourself, which I think is a really good idea. And I, that's what I do with the cello as well. I sing with the cello as as much as I can. Um, and they're great voices together, you know. But I did start right. just learning those songs way, way back then. And then at the Circus Oz years were much later and I'd been really experimenting with very different things. I'd gone electric. I was using effects, um, playing a number of instruments. and But basically, you know, they give you the job and you arrive and you're f the room is full of artistic, passionate people with really f fun ideas or ones to be worked out or, you know, uh, so much to be worked out because we created our own shows. We didn't get, we didn't have a composer. Um, I was the musical director. So virtually within minutes of arriving after someone else had taken the lead at the beginning, they said, we want you to be the musical director and we need you to change that and that and that and that. And then I just started writing. <laughs> and then we were using instruments because of that landscape. So it was so... Um, it's also Australia, you know, we're, we're still making up new stuff and we weren't in Europe or in a country where I feel um, there's a whole history that's sort of weighing down on everybody. You have to kind of follow these voices and you have to, uh, you know, pay homage to them. And you've got Franco in, um, in Spain and you've got just every European country certainly had this had that, but uh, my experience as a young musician was that we really had wide open spaces and there was every kind of music being played and ev every kind of pub in Melbourne where I moved to when I was 19. And uh, um, we were playing music on, tin on little teapots and we used thongophones, you know, those, those things of PVC pipe and we tuned them and made mm -hmm. fabulous music with that. And because we were musicians that were part of the act, we were performers as well and acrobats to an extent. We had an upside down band hanging from the ceiling, playing instruments, hanging literally uh, 180 degrees upside down. Um, I created, you know, after a while, at the beginning I had a double cello act, so there were two of us playing one cello. I just happened to join when one of the extraordinary act Acrobats, Teresa Blake, uh, was also, also a very good cellist. So we thought, let's make something of this. We tried being Siamese twins with rollerblades. <laughs> then we thought that was a bit dangerous for our cellos. And then, but we ended up with this fantastic double cello act where we both played. We played a duet on one cello and I was inside a chair because she was there before me. She got to sit on top of me. And um, <laughs> and my arms would come out, and it was a bit like um, like a Medusa of arms, you know, um, four arms playing one cello, and it was a good duet. And those kinds of inventions just kept going. Um, there's kind of many of them. Um, yeah, and it I sounds like you had a lot of a lot of freedom to to experiment and and really play. Um, so I'm I'm curious after you. You did. How how long were you at Circus Oz? From basically um, ten years, uh, uh, but eight years over a ten year period, from um, eighty seven to uh, it was nineteen ninety eight. 
I took one, uh, two okay. different years off, but 1998, I joined Cirque du Soleil. So that was my next question because uh, you 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 had a quite a, you know um, I would say a long tenure with Cirque du Soleil, didn't you? I did. It was it was I think about 15 years, really. Yeah. It was. So I mean, how, I okay. know it was. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. So what is the transition like? So you're at Circus Oz. How did, did you audition for Cirque du Soleil? No, actually, it was Jonathan Deans, the sound designer for um, Cirque at the time, and definitely for the show O oh, that I was asked to join. So he saw me in a show in Australia, and um, got my contacts, and we talked. And it, then it took a, a while. I, I didn't really even know what Cirque du Soleil was really, um, and I then had to send things and whatnot. And um, it, it took a while, but basically, I was part of the the um, musical cast of Oh, the Water Show in Las Vegas. Uh, so I joined them in 1998. So it was somebody actually seeing me. At that time I was playing cello, using my voice in pretty interesting ways, I think, and uh, a bit of banjo, a lot of bass guitar, um, yeah, cello. Yeah, sure. and Silk Soleil is like, that's like the pinnacle of what everybody, you know, people who are in the arts, uh, you know, people in Montreal, especially uh, that I met, whether they're uh, performers or acrobats or musicians. I mean, Silk Soleil really is like uh, at the top of the ladder in terms of career opportun- opportunities. Um, hmm. Oh, for yeah, sure. So th- it, it was an ex- extraordinary uh, long arm reach that they made. And Silk Soleil is, was really i think still is i'm not sure um i haven't been working with them and i know the situation's changed but they really were very good at putting an arm out uh, over long distances in the world and they even got better at kind of scouts i think i was the first australian to be with cirque and it was as a musician but um in the end I, uh, ben Wajutrao was the composer of O, oh, and he came to see me in a Circus Oz show in New York. That was kind of, that was it. I didn't get to do one of their auditions, and they're tough. I don't think if I'd done an audition, I would have got it. I was fortunate that I was in a show where I was at my strength doing what I'd made up, and um, it, it fit the bill. So then I got the invite, and I did four years with O. Oh, I decided to leave and went back to Australia and then came back to do Celine Dion. But um, it was it was a, such an incredible experience. I mean, some people, all these people are coming from, you have Lei who plays Arhu, you have uh, Volvo from Brazil origin, in the original the percussionist, uh, Lei, uh, Lei, that's what I already said, a, a lot of from Quebec for sure and Ontario, mm-hmm. um, and the cast. And we're all people from all over the place, all French-speaking kind of except for me and the, and the sound mixer. So, uh, And luckily with that show we had a lot of time because the theatre was late, The actual, sorry, the casino was late. So we prepared very, very well and for, for anything that went wrong. And you're talking about a a very complex technical show. Um, this is the sort of thing in Las, Las Vegas, those shows that Cirque du Soleil do there are co- very different from the tent shows. They really put down their roots and create extraordinary shows. The other show I was in was Car. I mean, you couldn't get a more technologically uh, <laughs> complex, expensive. Uh, there's big dreaming in there. But anyway, once I had a foot in and I did pretty well, I, I was – I was a different person because I, um, to some people who just waited for the parts to be given to me, I was used to creating things. So I was watching. I mean, this is my big passion is to watch physical performance, and what can I do to make something happen? So I I, ma- I made up a lot of sounds for that that weren't asked of me. And if the the microphone was on, then good. And if they wanted to use it, that's fine. So I brought in my little tip layer, which is a 10-string guitar from uh, Colombia, South America, and and started playing along to one of the pieces, and they really loved that. I did a lot of things with kind of a, you know, whistle with my hands, a lot of the, a lot of in and out breathing, um, 
and and also the sort of odd things I'd do with cello. So I got to be me in that show, whereas other people, uh, some other people, uh, you, you know, weren't maybe as, oh, I mean, no, all of them. Like, Tumani came from Senegal. They just let him rip. It's like, just start playing, man. You're an orchestra. He plays Cora. I don't know if you know that instrument. It's got multiple strings it's from Senegal. It's like a large skin gourd. And it... But anyway, there were a few of us that, that did our thing and um, some people got given parts and made it their thing. And from there, there I just I then did Celine Dion and then I did Car and then I did Amaluna. But th- there's a, a whole trajectory to that. It was a long time in, in Las Vegas, which probably wasn't the best city for me, but Boy, did it give me good work! And the desert's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, uh, it is a it is a different uh, a different machine. Uh, I just want to touch on the voice work really quickly here because you just gave like a very very quick sample. I want to play a little voice demo of that voice work of similar voice work that you've done. curious about that like how do you come up with is it just improvisation is that all it is well I started doing odd sounds with my voice because I wanted to make it into an instrument and I maybe especially when I was musical director with Circus Oz you'd need another instrument or a sound um, but you didn't necessarily want to sing words so there were a lot of times where you know, and a director would come in and say, oh, "We need a, we need it like a torrid or like a, at a bullfight," and 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 you, I'd just start, I'd let rip, and discover I had a voice that could do this incredible wailing, incredible to me, incredible to a few others. <laughs> I don't have a recording, so you can't, you can't hear it, and uh, and the listeners can't judge, but but the, in terms of the in and out breathing, honestly, I think I was a I realised that later I was a bit influenced by Rolf Harris, who did a lot of this. Um, in an, he's an Australian person who's now been uh, uh, brought down off his pulpit for bad behaviour, but he did a lot of this. Hey, you, uh, he didn't do it like me. I don't think I can imitate. But it was a, it's a way of kind of keeping rhythm and a and a and a, a soundtrack going and and being like a. Uh, sometimes ominous or uh, mysterious, or but without actually singing words. And hey, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, 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 I, I mean, I, uh, there are various people, so many people that muck around with the voice in this way. I mean, a yeah, it's um, even even in in Canada in the Aboriginal culture, I think there's a lot of that too. Yeah, well, you have one of the most famous ones, but I can't think of her name right now. 
Um, no, know. me either, actually. Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> but uh, that's terrible. But everybody, no, I know. everybody else. No, but at least we knows. recognize it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, we, we can recognize it as a very distinct kind of sound that we recognize it right away. Oh, okay, that's what that is, you know? Um, but yeah, it does have kind of worldwide influences. Um Ab- oh, you're you're so ahead. right. It's not it's not just North America, it's it's right it's all across I remember having a recording of voices from across the world at a young age. I don't know if it was an ABC thing or I don't know where I got hold of it, but you know, listening to um, t- uh, Kalahari Bushmen and their kind of noises that they make, and and people in uh, Eskimo and uh, uh, the Georgian men and the diff- the overtones, the t- the Tibetan, the Chuvan singers. Uh, the I think we start off with a vocal palette or a a vocal um um potential that just gets edited out like so much else and mm-hmm. if you if you're prepared to be a bit of a fool and I always like to muck around and I do a lot of accents and I'm not prepared to pull really crazy flat faces and I just started making um odd sounds with my voice quite young and it kept on going and I really love performers that do that I'm just thinking of LP you know and what she can do with her whistling Yes. You know, just people yes. that just go up. I'm just, it's just something I do. And you just say yes to it. And then, then, you know, later on down the track, you just keep mucking around and being a fool. And then it becomes something like a, a fairly um, intuitively uh, used, precious, fabulous, valuable part of a, of a sound landscape. Uh, now, here's in, what's in interesting, though. Yeah. Go. Here's what's interesting, though, is that the it seems like you know young artists, young musicians, young singers, they don't you find that there's like a, a pressure to be kind of you know uh, to conform and to be kind of more like pop star or pop singer, and and they're kind of a lot of them I find are discouraged from uh, really exploring with their voice as an instrument, or you know uh, I know a, a French. Um, uh, Paris Combo. There's a, a French group that uh, one of the guys he plays his trumpet under underwater, and it creates a whole other sound. And I find that there's um, those people are rare. Um, I think you can hear when someone's just doing a kind of they're just doing a copy. I don't know what's in the minds of people, but when I hear a, a copyist as against an original artist, I, I think we can feel it. Anyway, become it becomes self evident after a while, but. I don't, I've, because I moved to the United States in 1998 and I was 38 at that time, I'd done a lot of singing in different things and I had a big experience from another part of the world. And I feel like in the US and I, you know, you're in Ontario, I don't think it's the same in Quebec. Maybe it is, but USA is so full of extraordinary, recognized famous people there's they're very keyed into fame how you get there uh and who i'm going to sound like and this absolutely meaningless banal but but still suffocating pressure that you have to sound like somebody that we've already heard before if you're going through that um uh mainstream and then you've got YouTube and all of the other formats where people are just mucking around. I don't know. There's there's a sort of there's an angle of real invention that's come because people aren't being filtered through producers. But yeah, I, I, it, I do, it, fe- I actually... do feel. I uh, sorry. I do. F- I, I just want to finish my point about that. That yeah, yeah. Go I ahead. felt that in the USA, I was there. There were there were some musicians that were so insecure they had to talk about who they'd played with um you know and you kind of it was like if you didn't play with them or can you name someone you played with I mean they have a a a really crappy uh way of being a musician in the world and a lot of put downs to people from other parts of the world that don't play music in the same way people who are extraordinary but don't hear one at the same place or didn't know solfeggio. I mean, 
you know, musicians can be a wacky lot and need to be smacked down sometimes. And it's based, <laughs> like, just get on with it. And what interesting new sound have you got? And without even, without pushing and shoving it, I mean, I, I really think I grew because the situation, the performance was in front of me. We never had time to, um, if, sometimes not even to write it. You know, you'd have to make up the idea, communicate it quickly, respond to what was in front of you. It was happening live and you had to work out a language for just getting through it to because we had to get this music ready by yesterday. That humbles you and it makes you really creative and you use everything you've got. And it's not, um, it's not listening to, I really like her. I'm going to try and copy her and try and copy her voice. It's, and, and I, you know, uh, Anyway, you can, not everyone can be in Cirque du Soleil <laughs> and not everyone can be in, yeah, but, but I'm, I'm just saying that that playful, finding some mates and uh, being a bit kind of irreverent and, uh, you know, look at what Billie Eilish has done. She's, she's with her brother and she's made a sound and it's, it's completely her own it's in, and uh, she knows who she is and she can keep, but she's not copying anyone, I don't think. Of course, we draw on people that we like. I have I have a bunch of heroes, and more recently because I've stopped um, playing with Cirque du Soleil and I'm making up my own stuff, I, I'm, I really started to look around about who I admire, why do I admire them, who's making an interesting sound. Um, yeah, anyway, you should interrupt why me Why don't now. you tell me about <laughs> – <laughs> why don't you tell me about um... – is is that one of the reasons why? Like, I don't think you've ever been attached to a music label, have you? No, no, I didn't. I, I just, I was just like a slave to the shows, physical shows. Right. But then, I, but then I did stop. Um, I was in Amaluna, and I had a really major role. No, I was always within a show, and I think some people that I worked with uh, in within Cirque du Soleil, you know, doing ten shows a week, were very good, and some of them are still there ones that I started with are from the origin of that show, 1998, are still in that show. And they're able to, I don't think, I think they just go do the show and then they go home and and make up their own music and play with that band and, uh, you know, certainly as time has go, gone on for them, they found other ways to be at it. But I didn't, I wasn't really great at that. It's like I dropped all the... I was super creative in this chaotic, chaotic circus Oz environment, and then I went to work with in Las Vegas, and I, I just uh, went to the show, and that was kind of my identity. <laughs> I didn't do very much about all of the things that I really wanted to do, which is art, which I'm doing a lot more now, and writing my and 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 I didn't stay writing music much. I did a bit, but. Um, uh, maybe losing the point there a bit, but I think some people have gotten uh, are good at doing that while they're working on a gig that's that intense. They can do ten shows a week, and then they can go home and kind of create their side jazz thing that they do. Um, yeah, it's something that's very common with people who work in big industry. Whether you're working on a Hollywood film set, whether you're part of a crew, or you're part of Cirque du Soleil, is that it literally becomes your life. It you inhabit it for a while. But to all the people that I've spoken with um, who have gotten out and who don't work in big industry anymore, what they do credit that experience for is teaching them a sense of uh, discipline. And like you said that you, you know earlier, is that uh, you know you had to innovate really quickly. You didn't have time to write it down. Do you find that sometimes creativity blossoms when there's a bit of pressure? Absolutely. It blossoms under pressure. Uh, too much pressure. And you so there's eight things to be done and you'll get two of them done. And if you just lessen off the pressure, you'll get five of them done. And But without a timeline, me, I'm out. I need a timeline. I, I need a bit of pressure. And I really... Um, I really think I blossom when I'm respected and wanted and it's, you know, like I'm just like a child. Uh, if you, but, but it's extraordinary what I will do uh, under working with other people. Anyway, I, I also really love collaborating. That's another thing. 
it's more exciting. You know, I like to turn up to to other people. I'm very good at turning up to other people and a project in front of me. It's another test to turn up for myself. Yeah, collaboration is a, it's a beautiful thing. Did, have, you, have you done a lot of collaboration since you've left uh, Cirque du Soleil? I've done a lot of collaboration. It's kind of all I've been doing. I've been in a duo and a trio. We're in, we're in lockdown again and we've been in a pandemic, but, but I, I was in a, I'm in a trio with um, uh, artistic director of Momentum that is no longer, but John Fred Mezier and, and I with uh, a couple of other people changing percussionists and also with Marie Lily Cochon, who's an extraordinary uh, singer songwriter herself, and she plays mandolin and guitar. So, but so between those, but also I've done a lot of work with my partner Natalie, who I think is going to be one of your guests. Natalie Claude and I married. We met in Amaluna, where she played the male clown, and I played Prospera, the queen of and sorceress of the island. This was my kind of torch song. This is why, I was like, okay, I'll do three years of this, and then it, <laughs> it was a pretty good way to leave. I did another one, one other gig after. But um, oh, I'm sorry, I lost my point. Just keep because that just took me. No, sideways. well, I mean, you fell in love with a clown. I fell in love with the clown, didn't I? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you did. Yeah, I really did. Um, I wasn't expecting to, and I wasn't really looking for it. But uh, yeah, tell me a little bit about that. What's it like to to work with someone that you're dating? And uh, does did it feed your creativity? Was it hard? Were you, did you guys uh, find that you understood each other better because you were both creatives? Um, I think uh, within the context of, well, in my life, most of my partners have been related to my work. And I don't know where people find their partners. Uh, but, uh, otherwise, I think it's a whole different ball game now, but certainly at, at, at my age. but. But I, I didn't want to go on on a touring show, um, but I didn't want to live in Las Vegas anymore. I had a secure job with Carr, uh, but, uh, but you know, it had been eight years playing the same music. So I kind of took this risk and they asked me, you know, they'd seen what I did and a, a friend who works in Cirque du Soleil said, I think she could be good for this. And so they asked me um, and then I arrived. But the scary thing was, Oh God! Do I want to go on tour with a whole lot of young people that just want to go clubbing? That's what I'd heard. And then I think pretty there was a sort of a preamble for the main characters, and I met Natalie Claude, and there was a couple of other people somewhere near my age, uh, and that was a relief. And um, she's a real, she's a really creative. I don't know. So she was in a completely different role. I mean, the clowns. At Cirque du Soleil, they have to make up everything. Everybody hates them. They love them. It's it's so <laughs> under scrutiny. It's the worst <laughs> kind of thing that you could do to yourself. Um, except that you know there they were, Pepper Planner and um, and Natalie Claude, male and female. Natalie was playing a male clown with a big moustache, and she's done a fair amount of work in that in that uh, cross. Uh, cross theatre work so um but I think we were very relieved to meet each other and then when there was a change of composers a lot of people were let go so she wasn't sure and we saw each other I came back and I walked through the doors and said, oh my god we we're so relieved to see each other because you can well um it's rare to find someone actually anyway uh that is poetic creative intelligent generous kind fun and you like music and you like art and you like beauty and you like the a lot of similar things a lot of really important things and i really wasn't looking for it so i didn't expect to find it but while we were working together and um, we were traveling throughout the united states and canada for the first 2 years and there were a few which was kind of great. It was way more fun than I thought, just to pick up sticks and move on. It was like my Circus Oz days, and I discovered a lot of America and Canada. I mean, I went to Calgary, man. <laughs> <laughs> I went to Edmonton, and we had, we had of course, um, Vancouver and uh, Quebec City and Toronto. 
but there were a few uh, cancellations of seasons and we just took ourselves off and did a penichette trip, like a barge trip in the south of France for two weeks. And then we went to Venice for two weeks and we just sort of sort of made some big dreams happen uh, during that time. And uh, we always, you know, it's great to be able to come home when you're on tour and there's a show going on and you've, the artistic director's changed or this has happened. It's really great to have a few mates that you, you know, unravel with. It's always helped. It helped it at O even when I, I could go home. But to just really unravel and um, share ideas with. So I don't regret a thing about that. Yeah. Um, did you have, did you ever experience the kind of, um, the, you know, the feeling that you get after you've toured with a group of people for a while, let's say six months, you spend six months with a great team and then uh, it's it's over. Do you ever experience that that feeling of uh, in French we call it le deuil? I'm trying to think like a like a mourning. Do you ever experience that, and how do you cope with it? Um, I think my projects with circus were always long. I do I do know, and um, I do know that there's a, I do know this syndrome very well. It, it's something really exceptional to be part of a group that. You know, you're such a diverse bunch of people. But I remember this with uh, Circus Oz particularly because I'll, I'll just talk about that for a minute and then I'll come forward into the future. But it was a home. I mean, the tent would be put up, put up and if you got to be part of the group that went ahead and put up the tent. But there was always this incredible feeling of returning to, to your home amongst your mates and it, it it really excited me. It was very inspiring. It's it's really great to be part of something where you feel that family. And you, I mean, you don't get on with everyone. There's there's some roughies and toughies, and you're one of them or you're not. Or, but uh, um, I was thinking about that. That's one of the things I miss actually. But when, but I'm, I think in theatre this happens a lot. And uh, you know, I was working when I when I came here. I worked with uh, Natalie first on a duet, a duo show called Red Atom Lux, which was, I think, way better than we thought. Like everybody thought it was so good, and why the hell didn't we video record it? We were just too nervous. But now we're going to have to do it again. And then I was asked to be part of a Phenomena Festival uh, show, a Dada. It's usually Dada, but we were the opening act. So it was the cast of Momentum, and they asked me to do a 10-minute solo. And it was so great. That was, that's that thing where you enter in this thing, you've got a limited time, and you just have to come up with stuff. And it, you don't have a choice. And I love that thing if you don't have a choice because you've already got virtually everything under your nose. You, we always have. We've got almost everything we have under our nose unless we're, you know, under 20 or 25 maybe. But even then, um, and so, you know, John Fred and I were the band and we got in there and we, okay, he's doing a thing that's kind of really about, oh, God, we're going to use Sati for that. Great, great, great. And then over here, and I would trans, uh, transpose things if, for the, if they were going to be tenor sax or if I was going to play on bass or cello. And one day I forgot, I forgot to transpose one of them so for my B-flat tenor. And so we just played it like that, you know, it's like one tone out. His guitar, my my tenor sax end up being brilliant, these opportunities. But when that finished, um, there was, boy, did we feel good about it. Boy, did we work hard for it. And and I think then John Fred and I decided to reach out to each other and said, do you want to just get together and play some covers for a while? <laughs> you know? <laughs> But I I haven't been in in that uh, milieu where you you go in and you're really you know, like actors in theatre, where you go and make a show and then it finishes and you leave. I was in Circus Oz where we kept being together and we would create a show right. and then we would be have to, we'd go and take a break and then we'd come back and here we go. We have to try and make up a new show with a new theme. Wow, is that hard in a group? 
<laughs> yeah, so you were more like in a situation of long-term employment, essentially. Yes. Yeah, I was. Yeah, I, okay. So yeah. it's not the same. No, it's not. Uh, so what happens now? What? Who is Julie now? What does Julie want to do now? Um, I think I've I've um I've peeled a few things back since the pandemic. I was set to go and play in Gaspésie in a few different places with my good friend Marie Lily Cochon as our duo double croche, um, and then everything quit. So I sort of, and I didn't play so much music. Um, I've been, I, I wrote music for a film. I'm working on, on a theme song for the next film, which is more an animation than a documentary. I'm doing a lot of drawing in pastels, um, art and um, physical landscape have actually always been a big part of my um, uh, dreaming if you like. Um, even in writing music, I use landscape. I, I use the idea of moving through landscape, you know, up up the hill. You know, where's this energy moving to? I really like to sort of sense the rhythm of a person, uh, the rhythm of the thing in a show like, in, in a show, a complete show, you can break it down and go, okay, well, we that's that looks like it's going to be like that could be good scar because he's bouncing at that beat and he's got that energy and this person's kind of it's a constant struggle up that rope and um so I did that for the film and I'm just going to keep going working on my ability to work with um within Logic Pro and I've been drawing a lot of birch and uh, just to be witness just to be witness to, to an object in front, instead of being an abstractionist, which I started, I was painting all these abstracts and I kind of realised I didn't really know what I was wanted to look at, uh, what, what I was dreaming about. So I've gone back to art classes and then I'm just doing it by myself and trying to work with various medium to bring out what is actually in front of me. And I, it, it, it makes me feel so peaceful. To, so present moment to just be there and uh, here, sometimes I have to use a photo so that's not so great but you'll often find me, Julie McGuinness right now, walking between my little mini studio right here and just over to my left where I have an easel and a whole bunch of pastels and paints and I get caught in between. Sometimes I'm holding a paintbrush and I don't realise, you know, so I'm kind of I'm not suffering as much as as m much as many other people in this pandemic because I'd kind of come back to a more internal life. But I cannot wait to perform live for people. I I, I really miss it. Yeah, there's something to be said uh, about. First of all, there's two points I want to make here, which is one. Artists are often not just artists with their main craft. A lot of them are visual artists who also play guitar or actors who also sing opera. Um, it, it's not uncommon for artists to actually try something new or do something else, much like you've done with, um, with, your, with your visual art. And I guess one of the questions I had for that is, do you listen to music when you're, when you're drawing? Yes, I do, uh, but not always. Sometimes. And um, it has to be I, I, I don't know about everybody else, but I find these days you know, I would listen to an old album, a whole album when I was a kid, but now I listen to three songs from an artist I really like and I want to switch it over. So I'm, I've am i kind of perfected my calm music, but then the calm music can drive me nuts. There's a few people I listen to, but I, I don't actually need it. But I've always needed, I think I've always needed art and I've, my art and my love of light and colour and uh, architecture um, has always influenced what I do with music. I actually went to art school. I didn't go to music school. So, so music was the kind of the background job or, you know, the, I just filled that up so well. And uh, to be an artist when you're 17 or when you just leave school, when you don't quite know what you want to say, uh, to go to art school, that was a bit savage, but now I'm returning to it. But I, I think that's really true. I, I don't, um, 
I think a lot of I think most people have many they have multifacets and it's rare to find an opportunity or a show or a company that will allow you to bring all the things you have or at least two of them you know can you be a musician and a performer a lot of musicians aren't performers that they're not all performers they just want to sit back and they kind of resent having to put makeup on just to go out for the finale scene you know when live music is dying and they're worried about that it's, and uh but but many people that i really like are are writers and they're artists um uh they're directors they create their own material you know i think the i i think the people i i really like um well, anyway, I'm a big fan of Joni Mitchell, and she's a painter, and she's a drawer, and you can hear, you can hear the painting in her songs, and you can hear the, um, uh, you know, that you can sort of see the songs in her painting, and it, and it's the same with Leonard Cohen. You can, you know, he's a poet, and uh, and and he's a musician, and he's a. Uh, Anyway, there's there's better examples, yeah. but 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 there's a whenever there's a cross, and then there are people like, um, you know, Nina Simone, another person that I really admire, and Laurie Anderson. I mean, Laurie Anderson is absolutely visually stimulated, absolutely visually ad- adept, um, and she's a poet, and she ain't gonna ever make the music more music than poetry uh, you know they they're seamless the, these are people that have have absolutely um melded their craft of, of the things that they like to do and they they do them all um and and bring them together uh, you know she, she's a sort of a spoke singer I mean, she's one of my idols nina simone who i just brought up earlier she's an activist um and she's a fighter and she was going through extraordinary pain and extraordinary uh prejudice and she she took a grit and a and a talent and her lessons and put those all together so you know there's there's never there's rarely an interesting artist up there who hasn't got you know, several bows in their hey, what's the what's the expression? Bows in their hand, hats in their thing, hats to ha- yeah. I don't know. I'm French, so I I can just say I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, lucky you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know common English expressions very well. Um, Julie, quickly, I'm curious. Did you ever suffer from an imposter syndrome at any time? Feeling like you don't deserve to be on stage, or feeling like you're not good enough, things like that. Oh, Did you ever cope oh, with that? Absolutely. Oh my God, lived with it all my life. Like, never played the cello fast enough. Learned from a violin teacher, went down to a private girls' school where everybody could play faster and wilder. You know, not, could never really play an orchestra, but had my own style. I mean, really, the charlatan, feeling like you're a charlatan is another way of saying it, that people say it. Live with me my whole life, and I'm a woman, and I'm Australian. So, there's whole bunches of absolutely useless, wasteful self-deprecation. <laughs> but yeah, absolutely. I felt like, like, well, how did I get here? Uh, well, why did they choose me? You don't really know who you are. One minute you're being criticised, and you know nobody really says you're good, and then the next minute you're over in America, being paid very well, and you've got this incredible costume on and you know it's all very confusing (laughs) so but you just you just went on stage you 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 performed regardless right I mean it's something that you live with it 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 follows you it's like a shadow that just follows you everywhere and you just you just overcome it is that what happens I think I think um I think I'm bolder than the way I describe myself and I I I think that you do have to be bold you have to there's there are moments where you go what am I doing here but you just write you get kind of you know from being a young child just going out and playing in a Stedfords and and being absolutely shit scared 
but then you go out and then something is released. And, you know, my mother would say, we never heard you sing like that until you were out on the stage. And there is something about, there is some truth, uh, I can say it personally, to arriving on a stage and you just, it's like you just have to pull on everything you have. And it's so expansive. It's so liberating. And audiences are so generous. They're not like the people around the room. You'll never get that liberating freedom from just a bunch of people kind of going, okay, I think that's good. You go out and and, and you give it your all. But, yeah, ar- arriving out on a stage and, um, yeah, uh, what I was trying to say is that there's a, there's a boldness. To, to play with musicians, to cross countries, to play in different musical styles, you have to wing it and you have to kind of, you know, there are times when it doesn't work and you really aren't prepared and you really don't have the chops. And then um, if it interests you, you're going to work on it and you'll come back and, and try a bit harder, but um, not but anything. That's it. Uh, you just say yes to what you're passionate about and 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 I really feel I just I really really believe in that I think I said yes to a lot of things I was very happy to say yes and I, and it really served me well because boy did people say yes back to me <laughs> they really did I found incredible supporters uh, people who just said I think you'd be great in this and my we want you to play Prospera the queen of the island you know you've been I've been playing downstairs at car in the shadows. It's like, oh. yeah, you do. I, I have not. I've actually never seen you perform. Unfortunately, I've only seen a few uh, Cirque Soleil shows, and and of course, I was was not in Australia, so I didn't see you in Circus Oz. But I have seen uh, videos and images, and you ha- you exude a a presence when you are on stage. Um, you know, of course, I again I was not in the audience, but just from looking at photographs and videos you have a presence that is um it's quite mind-blowing and I can understand why they put you on stage it makes sense because you have that presence you have that confidence that kind of uh you know earth shattering like I am here (laughs) you know yeah it's it's interesting because you know I have a mother who you know it's like don't you pose you know if you get up there and pose you know she she, she was very anti anybody putting on any airs but um, but you know, I already said that they are incredibly supportive. There is something that happens to people who um, have that performance kind of bug or um, not bug, but uh, ingredient, and um, it's it, it it it's it's really good. It, it's really good for me to just be honest and and own up to that because. Because something happens and I become more expanded. And if, you know, it's great when you do the work. You know, if you've done the work, you have to do the work. But, um, you know, all the material that you're going to do. But I've gone out to some performances where there was one I did for the Momentum Phenomena Festival, the Dada thing with with them. And I had my own light because it's one of the things I do with my cello walking with my own cello and I have my own light. So the lighting person thought, well, she's going to, that's all she needs. And I walked out and I couldn't see anywhere I was going. And um, <laughs> I mean, there's just a zillion kind of versions of that, of, of you just have to make it happen. And when Natalie and I were doing Redditum Lux, we didn't know what we had, and, but we did have a bit of a spiritual practice and we really just did a little bit of like meditating on that. And there's something about being out there with a performer, your friend, uh, my wife in this case, uh, and you want them to do well. And that's that's something else. That was the Circus Oz thing too. It's like you're in a team and like, we've got to make this work and it's like you're part of the footy team and you're going to make sure the goal gets hit. You know, it, there's something about being part of a group, even if it's you by yourself, me, I'm better when there's somebody else and I want them to do well. I'm, v- And then then there's this energy that comes. And it's not about you. It's kind of about them. So there's this sort of expansive thing that it just explodes. You, you know, 
they fuck up and you're there to pick them up and you fuck up and they there to, and uh and if you've got a little bit of improvising and if, and some and some you know cajones then there we go and it's so fun oh my god it's so fun yeah what it sounds it sounds uh i mean i've done a little bit of theater in montreal and and it was addictive just just um working with people, feeling supported by them as well. As much as you want to support them, you feel supported by them. And it's just beautiful. Uh, listen, Julie, we're almost out of time. I have one last question for you, and it's very quirky. Okay. Uh, so I want to know, does your cello have a name? No. You don't name your instruments? You don't uh, give them I a don't. personification of any kind? I have three cellos, um, and I have... Two guitars and one bass guitar, three guitars and a ukulele. No, they don't have names. Aren't I odd? But there's the wood, the beautiful yeah. wood original cello that's like the German factory one with the kind of brass pegs that's still in Las Vegas. I had the one that's made by Alain Carbonari where he had to kind of cut the actual tree down and he puts them in with the spiders and then you have to put the cello against the bass amp so that it... It knows to be a cello, so that was a new one. You have to do that to new instruments. And I have a red cello <laughs> that is a carbon fibre one that's like tomato red, which I adore because it doesn't go out of tune when you're playing in the snow. But you asked me whether I had names, and no, they don't. Hmm. I had to ask. Um, Julie, where, <laughs> Julie where, do, where can people learn more about you online? Um, I'm a very non-online person. As you said, I haven't really, I, I don't even have a website. I mean, how crappy is that? I suppose you can look up. Do you have a Twitter? Or? No, I'm really not a social media you person. Have nothing. I'm actually building a website at the moment, but if you look for Julie Good. McInnes, it's M C I N N E S. Um, I, yeah, I'm not going to allow all of everybody to be on Facebook. I mean, but of course, if you look up, if you Google me under with the right spelling, You'll find a, f a few links to ver various things, but you're you you're so right. Everyone everyone's asked me that. It's like, where are your CDs? Where are your? I, I am on SoundCloud, Cloud, and it's uh, Jula Mac, Jula Mac on SoundCloud. So there's a, there's a, and I'm also on Doug Lacroche SoundCloud. There's a lot of my material in both those. Um, yeah, SoundCloud is a good one, guys. Go go check out uh, Julie on SoundCloud. There's uh, some really good. Uh, Music on there, good um, voice work and collaborations that she's done on uh, on SoundCloud. Yeah, yeah that's so listen, it. Uh, yeah, go. Yeah, uh, so thank you for joining me today. It's been a, a wonderful chat. There's a lot I learned about you that I didn't know uh, before. So it's been a, a great pleasure, and uh, it's been a great pleasure oh, I to hope it was. Uh, introduce I, you. I can get lost, and and my God, am am I uh, following you? I'm, I'm in. Ab Absolute admiration. And I wanted I thought we were even gonna talk about your tardigrades grades and, and the earth and the planet, <laughs> but that's not my calling, is it? I I'll keep listening. I hope everybody else will too. Lots of love, Julie. Thank you. Thank you, Julie.